Hi, my name is Andrew Barvis. This is a presentation on acute diverticulitis. The objectives of this presentation will be the following. Number one, understand the basic pathophysiology of diverticulitis. Number two, understand the clinical manifestations of diverticulitis and the diagnostic studies used to establish the diagnosis. And number three, understand the medical and surgical treatments for diverticulitis. We will review the epidemiology, pathophysiology, clinical presentation, diagnosis, classification, and treatment of acute diverticulitis. Let's start with the epidemiology. Diverticulitis is a disease process that is more common in Western and industrialized societies. Additionally, the prevalence of diverticulosis increases markedly with age. Is only present in 10% of adults under age 40, but is estimated to be present in 50 to 70% of adults age 80 or older. Overall, approximately 80% of patients presenting with acute diverticulitis are older than 50 years of age. Acute diverticulitis is responsible for approximately 130,000 inpatient hospitalizations in the United States per year and is associated with substantial health care expenditures. Let's review the basic pathophysiology of diverticulosis. Colonic diverticuli are outpouchings of mucosa and submucosa that protrude through the muscular layer of the colonic wall. The formation of diverticuli is promoted by increased intraluminal pressure within the colon from decreased fecal bulk. This may be associated with the typical lower fiber diets of Western countries. Diverticuli occur most commonly at sites where arterioles penetrate the muscular wall of the colon. The sigmoid colon is the most commonly affected portion. The picture on the lower right demonstrates the presence of diverticulosis as viewed from a colonoscope. Now let's review the pathophysiology of acute diverticulitis. Acute diverticulitis represents infection and associated inflammation arising from perforation of a diverticulum. This process is usually initiated when the narrow neck of a diverticulum becomes obstructed by fecal matter, leading to distension of the diverticulum, bacterial overgrowth, and ultimately perforation. The severity of acute diverticulitis can vary on a wide spectrum, ranging from local inflammation of a limited portion of colon to free perforation with widespread contamination of the peritoneal cavity. The typical clinical presentation of acute diverticulitis includes left lower quadrant abdominal pain and fever. There may also be associated changes in bowel and urinary habits. It is important to note that certainly not all patients manifest typical clinical symptoms and a high index of suspicion should be maintained in patients with known diverticulosis and acute abdominal pain of any type. The diagnosis of acute diverticulitis is established by a combination of laboratory tests and imaging studies. Typically, patients demonstrate an elevated white blood cell count. Plain film images of the abdomen may demonstrate free intraperitoneal air if frank perforation has occurred. The imaging study of choice, however, is a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis with oral and IV contrast. This may demonstrate findings of either complicated or uncomplicated diverticulitis. Uncomplicated cases involve only local inflammation of the colon, usually the sigmoid colon. Cases of complicated diverticulitis involve more extensive inflammatory processes and are associated with an adjacent abscess, fistulization, free perforation, or bowel obstruction. This image from a CT scan demonstrates a large pelvic abscess from a case of complicated diverticulitis. Usually, this type of abscess will be treated with CT-guided percutaneous drainage. Let's discuss the classification system for complicated diverticulitis. This system is known as the Hinchy classification system, and there are four stages of increasing severity. Stage 1 is defined as a confined pericolonic abscess. Stage 2 is defined as a larger walled-off abscess, typically located in the pelvis. Stage 3 is defined as generalized purulent peritonitis from a perforated diverticulum. Stage 4 is defined as generalized fecal peritonitis from widespread contamination of the peritoneal cavity arising from free perforation. Let's move on to the treatment of acute diverticulitis. This differs by the severity of the episode. For uncomplicated diverticulitis, 
that is, an episode without associated abscess, perforation, fistula, or obstruction, the mainstay of therapy is antibiotics. Patients with severe symptoms of pain typically require inpatient hospitalization, bowel rest, and IV antibiotics. Those patients with less severe symptoms can be treated on an outpatient basis with oral antibiotics. The treatment of complicated diverticulitis is more complex and depends on what particular type of complication has occurred. In the most extreme case of free perforation with significant contamination of the peritoneal cavity, surgical intervention is required, consisting of exploratory laparotomy, sigmoid colectomy, and end colostomy, also referred to as a Hartman's procedure. If a large pericolonic or pelvic abscess is present but there is no free perforation, usual treatment consists of CT-guided percutaneous drainage of the abscess and treatment with IV antibiotics. If fistulization has occurred, this will likely re require operative correction, but usually this is undertaken on a semi-elective basis after resolution of the acute inflammatory process. Finally, if diverticulitis has resulted in colonic obstruction, this will require operative intervention with sigmoid colectomy. This illustration depicts a two-stage operative approach to complicated diverticulitis, usually employed when a patient presents with free perforation with significant intra-abdominal contamination. The first stage, also known as a Hartman's procedure, consists of a sigmoid colectomy to remove the diseased segment of bowel and the creation of an end colostomy. The rectal stump is oversewn and left in situ. The second stage procedure typically occurs at least three months later and consists of repeat laparotomy with the creation of an anastomosis between the descending colon and rectal stump to reestablish continuity of the colon. Let's discuss the general principles involved in surgical management of diverticular disease. As we have previously mentioned, in the emergency setting with free perforation and significant intra-abdominal contamination, the usual treatment is emergency sigmoid colectomy and with end colostomy or Hartman's procedure. However, in less severe cases, the acute inflammatory process is treated with IV antibiotics and bowel rest. Any associated abscesses are drained percutaneously. After resolution of the acute inflammation, the patient can be discharged and brought back at a later date for an elective sigmoid colon resection. In the elective setting, the colon is mechanically prepped and a primary anastomosis is performed in a single-stage procedure. There is some controversy in the surgical literature about when patients should undergo elective sigmoid colon resection for diverticular disease. Factors to consider include patient age, number of previous episodes of acute diverticulitis, and whether prior episodes were uncomplicated or complicated. Another well-established surgical principle is that the entirety of the sigmoid colon must be removed down to the level of the proximal rectum to avoid recurrence of diverticulitis in the future. In summary, diverticulitis is a common occurrence, particularly in Western countries. In uncomplicated cases, the mainstay of therapy is a course of antibiotic treatment. In cases of complicated diverticulitis with a pericolonic abscess, CT-guided drainage is frequently necessary. Patients with free perforation and intra-abdominal contamination require emergency surgery consisting of sigmoid colon resection with end colostomy.